were correct. <laughs> Hello, Houston. We're um, operating with a set of mixed signals here today, so I apologize for the roughness of the start. Uh, let me back up and kind of go through what we were talking about last time, uh, and that had to do with uh, being in the middle of looking at uh, hardiness as an overall psychological feature, one of several we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I got partway through the, the um, factors that tend to show up. If you study people who are hardy, um, the question then is, how do you know that? What, what kind of features do you expect in their, um, in their behavior? And it turns out that there are several general features of such individuals that can be identified, which tends to impact, in essence, the way they, um, the way they, they deal with the, the rest of the world. And so, in essence, if we look at hardiness as kind of an end state, we're talking about somebody who's uh, kind of not rigid, but resistant against the, the um, difficulties that the world tends to toss at us in terms of trying to cope and exist in the world, basically. But there are three general features that people who are psychologically hardy tend to exhibit. One is essentially a sense of commitment. Uh, not in a bad sense, but rather in the sense that, that um, th we could identify that as essentially involvement in whatever it is that they're doing. They're not alienated from it. It's not something visited upon them. It is something that they kind of incorporate into themselves. And one of their general features in dealing with the world is essentially that they're, they're committed, uh, dedicated to what they're, what they're involved in. A second general feature uh, that also seems to be um, observable is the idea of, of accepting things as a challenge. That is, in one sense, our world is constantly changing. You don't have to look any further than General Motors and, and the fact that every, every summer we're encouraged to buy a whole new set of cars, uh, throw everything out and start over again annually, which really puts a, a significant emphasis on change. Um, and somebody who is hardy tends to essentially view that change as kind of a fact of life. They view change as, as essentially um, um, the norm rather than stability. They don't tend to think of the world as a static situation, but a changing one. And therefore, they kind of factor that into, into their own lives. And so when they're pressured to change, encouraged to change in one way or another, um, they convert it not, for, not, not into a threat, but rather into an opportunity to grow. OK, here's who I am now, but this is the demand that's being made on me. Let's see what we can do with it. Um, the faculty and undergraduates here at the University of Houston have faced that uh, in recent times as we've moved toward accepting the challenge, putting it upon ourselves, of becoming a tier one institution, uh, which is going to be a relatively significant move intellectually in terms of what, they, what the campus is doing, what the faculty is demanding of, of the students, what the students are expecting, and so forth. That's a major challenge, but in, in a sense it's viewed as a growth opportunity, not as something that's been weighed on, in on us uh, in one way or another. That would be uh, the approach of the hardy in, in this kind of an environment. And the final thing is essentially a sense of, of control. Um, I'm referring here back to, to Julian Roeder's work on, on an internal locus of control. And that, if you remember, we've never talked about his work directly, but you, are, you should be familiar with it in general now. And the key concept that he basically contributed there is do you have an, an internal locus of control, the idea that you essentially control and, and dictate what happens to you and benefit from things as you choose to do so, or does the world essentially force itself on you, which would indicate then that you've got a, a if that's your view, then you would have essentially an external locus of control. Um, hardy people, people who are hardy, um, tend to have an internal locus of control um, with the view that they are an instrumental source of, of the, the good things that happen to them and also the, the ability that they have to avoid having bad things happen to them. So the, the overall sense is uh, control. I control, I invite, encourage the good things that happen to me and I, and I am directly involved in the, the behaviors that I exhibit that, that result in, in the, um, the, the um, avoidance of, of bad behaviors. Which leads to a rather interesting question and that is, okay, given all that, can we train that? Is that essentially a trainable skill of one sort or another? And the answer is essentially yes. There are at least three different factors that we can practice, that we can teach to others and that we can encourage in ourselves in trying to, to maintain hardiness and the benefits that, that accompany that kind of an, an approach to the, um, to the world. One of these uh, that is to be taught is essentially learning the ability to essentially reconstruct the situation 
in a given environment. Um, Reanalyze your assumptions. If, if anything goes wrong or doesn't go quite as you had planned it to go, back up a little bit and re reconstruct what happened. What was the situation that, that led into the, the uh, resulting behavior that you didn't like or the response that you didn't like, whatever. What you essentially do in that kind of a situation is, is to increase your problem solving skills. That, that's the, the way in which you convert it into a, uh, uh, a challenge uh, by reconstructing the situation. Very simple problem that students often should deal with, don't maybe always deal with as, as they ought to, and that is suppose you get a low grade. Not even necessarily a, a, a B. If you get an A, but it's an A minus when you expected an A, even for a top student, that could be considered a challenge to your, your ability. Some instructor is kind of and, and essentially, no, no, that's A minus. Well, take it upon yourself to make an appointment with that person. Whoever's given you the grade or the, the graduate assistant in the course, whoever is, is actually grading the papers and came to the decision that that's an A, that's a B, badly, that's a C or a D or, or whatever. Um, but what you're going to do is essentially make an appointment with the cause of the difficulty. And I would suggest that the best way to go in is, uh, I saw some rather interesting film the other day on, on uh, one of the television shows that is a kind of a topical approach to things. And what they did was to ride along with some police officers um, who, in the course of their highway activities, occasionally had to haul people over for speeding or some, some infraction that any of us are guilty of when, when being on the state highways. And there was one rather interesting um, scenario that, w that was caught on film where, in fact, the, the officer had walked up to the, to the car and the driver rolled the window down in a kind of, well, it was this side, in, the, in a kind of an aggressive manner and looked right at the officer and said, yeah, have you got a problem? not necessarily the best way to start a discussion with somebody who's just hauled you over theoretically for having violated a law of some sort. So in replaying that in his own head later, perhaps what that driver ought to have done is kind of reconstruct the situation, sensitive to the idea that you might get a more positive response out of people if, if you're assertive in the way you do it, but, uh, but not not simply aggressive, in your face, aggressive kind of thing here. So what you, what you need to do essentially in, in that kind of a situation, any kind of a situation where it doesn't have the results you wanted, is to review your own, own responses in that situation. Make the underlying assumption, maybe there was a better way to do what I tried to do in that situation. Review your study strategies would be another possibility. Um, Ask for extra work. That's very hard to tell students to do, particularly when you're in a school that is as overloading as we are, when you're, the average student is working some 20, 24 hours a week, statistically, uh, and all of you probably think, no, it's closer to 30 for me, and so forth. And then you're trying to carry five courses at the same time. It's a lot of pressure. Um, but in essence, uh, in order to get over a problem in a course, one way to do it is simply ask for an assignment of problems like the one that's giving you difficulty, simply to give you practice in going through that kind of literature or with that kind of a perspective to redo it in some way. Reconstruct the situation and pull from it the areas that were giving you difficulty and, and work toward developing strategies that will get you through it more successfully. A second thing um, that is involved in, in, that is skills to be taught in terms of achieving what the hardy are capable of doing is to increase your ability to focus. That is uh, essentially use insight to locate the actual causes of your stress in, in a given situation. If you're trying to become hardy, cope and deal with mounting stress in one way or another, um, what you might do is, is, to, um, is to focus on, concentrate on your, your negative uh, body sensations when they occur. I find myself when I wake up in, in the morning, uh, every now and then, if I, if I don't make it all the way to the alarm clock, I'm sitting there, kind of sitting there, lying there, kind of cognitively reviewing what I'm going to have to achieve during the day. And if I've got something that is, is not pleasant or, or a job that I really don't wish to be involved in or something, I may find myself there by the time I'm done thinking about it, absolutely tense. And it's just literally a matter of saying, relax. And, and you just have to concentrate on letting that tension go because that tension is not helping you and it certainly doesn't benefit anybody else. So it's really wasted energy. And that's one of the things that I am aware of in myself that sometimes when I get into a, analyzing a given situation, I get so wrapped up in, in what I'm trying to achieve or the, the difficulties I'm gonna wrap, uh, run into that it gets to be kind of reflected in, in the muscles. Um, and in essence, what you're trying to do in, in, in Coming, coming, to, coming to grips with that, essentially focusing on it, is, is to analyze when that kind of a situation occurs. I just gave you an example of when I recognize that it, it occurs in me. Analyze why they occur. Not only when, but why they occur and where they occur. Um, 
in, out here in the real world, if you have that kind of a, just that kind of a specific reaction or any kind of negative reaction, analyze it enough to, to kind of keep mental notes about are there particular people with whom you get that kind of a reaction? Are there particular situations in which you tend to run into that kind of a, 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 um, a, a bodily reaction, kind of reflecting the internal stress that you're under? Um, and what you're trying to do essentially is, is to take that energy that's being directed or misdirected in some cases in, into increasing your stress level and essentially learn to redirect it redirect that energy into positive things that you can do to, to alter the situation, to keep those situations from occurring, or get them under control and, and um, calmed down before they become major teeth-clenching kind of uh, sources of discussion or, or anxiety in, in your own life. And the third thing you can do, this, this is kind of, in, in one sense, it's a duck and run kind of strategy, but the third kind of thing that you can do is essentially improve yourself in another arena. Um, if you think, if, if you flunk a course, for instance, one possibility is, is uh, to consider changing major, or if you flunk a course in a given area as broad as psychology, what you might do is consider, I mean, there, there are a number of different cleavages or, or differences in our field, but one very clear one is the difference between clinical as opposed to experimental psychology. And if you happen to bomb a course in experimental psychology, it doesn't mean you just wipe off the entire field and go do something else. You might consider going over into the, the uh, applied side of the, of the discipline, take some courses in, the, in that area and see how that goes. So in that case, what you're doing is, is um, taking that one disaster and using it as a reason to look at, at other possible ways to look at uh, the study of human behavior. Um, and if you, if you do flunk, um, you might consider simply switching majors, ultimately. And that certainly happened in my case. I think I've recited already the fact that I entered my undergraduate school as an engineer. That was my chosen major, simply because my father had been an engineer. And um, when I was done with the first year, I got this most diplomatic letter back from the faculty saying that uh, the engineering faculty that had thought that I would be more effectively challenged in another area, which was a really diplomatic um, get out of here kind of letter, but really very carefully expressed. Um, and it did cause me to reassess my, my strategy, which was essentially to get out of engineering and move over into um, um, general science is, is what I moved to because I had kind of general skills in, in science but I, uh, abilities, but I simply didn't know what I really wanted to pursue as a lifetime career. This at a time when I was just finishing a rising sophomore. Um, and so in that case, the solution was simply change majors, move over into general science and in, in arts and science and see what, what happens. And um, I will later tell the story of how I ended up in, in psychology because it bears more on something I'm gonna be saying here later. Um, but making that kind of a change in your life, uh, first of all, is an assertion of control. It is your life, you need to dictate how it's gonna be spent. Um, and if it's done successfully, it ends up building self-confidence and, and restores to you a sense of control, uh, which you really lose when a faculty in any college or department essentially says, no, that's not good enough. That's flunking work or, you know, whatever. Um, so you pick another area. And so ultimately it is still your life and you gain control over it, regain control over it in that way. Let's focus on a particular thing that I've mentioned a couple of times without actually really labeling it. And that is another key factor in, in coping as a strategy is essentially control your anger. You may remember that we talked once before about the frustration aggression hypothesis. Do you remember the key elements of that? It's not hard to do. I mean, that's, that's a hypothesis that pretty well labels itself. But essentially what it has to do with is the fact that across a wide number of not only humans but animals, um, anger is a common response to any negative event. Life is going to offer you negative events at times, and aggression may or may not be the best way in which to, um, in which to deal with it. Um, given something we've already just finished talking about here recently, here's a situation where you might actually want to try applying uh, Albert Ellis's um, rational emotive therapy as, as a, um, a particular response or patterned set of responses that, that could deal with this particular situation if, if if you find yourself getting angry or causing other people to be angry. Um, and in fact, I guess the question I would ask you to pose it to you in kind of an easily answerable way is simply, do you, are you aware that people really simply explode uncontrollably into anger when it happens? Normally there are signs that anger is growing in somebody. I mean, there are things that they will say well ahead of simply exploding in your face. Um, and the question is becoming, or the, the advice there is essentially, first of all, 
a defensive strategy, which ultimately becomes an, an, uh, an, an offensive, forward-moving strategy, is a very simple piece of advice, count to 10. When you've got a given situation, maybe you're dealing with a clerk and, and some of the difficulties that he or she has, um, when you make a statement that doesn't create the kind of answer that you really want, one of the things you might do is it'll create a pause in your own, own output for a minute is simply count to 10. Don't move your mouth. That's not what I have in mind, but mentally just give yourself about 10 seconds to calm down, to process what they've said, maybe back off enough to think a little bit about why on earth are they saying that? And one of the things that I've found over the years, because I am an in-your-face kind of an individual generally, particularly when I'm dealing with clerks whom I've hired to do something or I'm, whom I'm paying to, to offer some kind of a service, I have found that oftentimes when people make that kind of a statement, if you just give them a minute, 10 seconds, they have time to not only, you know, watch for your reaction, but then when they see that you're just kind of, you know, thinking about it, it gives them time to think about it too. And oftentimes what you'll find, and sometimes in that kind of an interaction, the, the easiest way to get through it is don't react or don't react immediately. And it gives them time to kind of think through the last impulsive thing that they may have said or thing that they said impulsively. And in some cases, I've found that people actually, well, what I really mean is, and then they'll go back and kind of qualify what they were trying to say. And, and in the fastness of give and take, maybe they say it a little more harshly than they really meant to. So that, that count to 10 is a more important piece of advice than it, than it might actually, or implication from this theory, um, than it might seem at first. The underlying um, logic here is essentially that anger can be controlled, okay? Thoughts that may be automatic um, become so only because there's, there's no effort directed at trying to control them, trying to keep them from being expressed. And so in, in terms of, of rational emotive therapy, the, the frustration can be a very simple one. Um, you may have a friend that comes up to you after you've had a lousy day. I mean, the, the setting situation here is the fact that you go to school and have a lousy day. Okay, and when you get home or back to your apartment or whatever, a friend or somebody comes over and the activating event in, in the sequence that I'm describing here is that your friend may ask you innocently enough, how was your day? How did things go at school? And the net result is that if, if, you, um, if, if you jump to, to irrational thoughts in this kind of a situation, a la uh, Ellis, essentially you may be reaching a, a conclusion of, of essentially, he's just trying to needle me and upset me. I mean, that person has clearly got it out for me, given the day I've had. Well, of course, they have no idea what kind of day you had. That was the reason they asked you. How did the day go? And you don't want to over-install excuses and, or reasons in their head in a given situation. But then what you need to do is, is to look at um, the variety of consequences that may be kicked off in that kind of a, a jump to, he's just trying to needle me. Well. The net result may be a rejection of your friend. It could be an increase in your anger, given the day that you had. Um, a decision that because he asked you, he's really trying to needle you. Um, and as a result, you end up angrier after talking to that person or after that person talks to you than you were before he asked you, in, in potentially in total innocence of, of, uh, with no knowledge of the day that you actually had, which was the reason he asked to pose the question to begin with. I meant to show you that. Look at the screen. I slaved on creating this. Watch this. It took me an hour to do that. Uh, I was quite thrilled with my uh, PowerPoint prowess in that particular instance. Sorry for bragging, but I thought it was an interesting effect. So in any case, in terms of RET, rational emotive therapy, what you want to do instead is to jump to rational alternatives. Let's think of some ways in which we can get out of that situation more beneficially, not only for, or particularly for you in this situation. It may be that he's simply idly curious. He, he's not socially gifted and he can't think of any other way to start a conversation. So we'll simply put it in your court by saying, how was your day? What did you do at the university today? Basically, what, what it does is to help focus your cognitive uh, reactions before behaving in terms of them. Consider the alternatives before you actually act. It helps you keep your level of arousal down as you think of positive alternatives instead of negative alternatives. It, remains that, uh, it reminds you, of course, that you shouldn't simply assume that everyone's underlying pressures for behaving are negative or intent. That It's not necessarily the case that someone who approaches you has a negative intent to make you feel bad. That may be the consequence, but maybe it was because of the day that you, that you had in that situation. What you need to do is to emphasize, essentially, what's going on here and now. That's what you need immediately to deal with, although it may be in the context of, of uh, broader 
kinds of, of knowledge of the individual, of the overall situation you're in, and so forth. But essentially, the going slow um, gives you time to process through all the things that I've talked about. I mean, in a face-to-face -face interaction, you've got about five or 10 seconds to interact, uh, enact this, but, but it is a, a valuable way to, to uh, improve interaction with you and colleagues. But then there are a number of other coping strategies that we can also deal with, one of which is, is simply learning to relax. Um, the fact that, that uh, anger tends to arouse you um, is countered by the fact that, that relaxing will act, act in exactly the opposite way for you. The, 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 one of the side effects of getting angry is that your tension level tends to go up. Um, and therefore, a very simple advice like counting to 10 or taking a deep breath can, can give you a chance just to, to back off from whatever's got you annoyed and give you a chance to, to relax and exhale. The count to 10 strategy that I was talking about is, is a very effective way to do that. And essentially what it gives you time to do is to focus on the positive and eliminate the negative. That is, don't, don't pursue the negative assumption in each case. Look at ways to turn a particular situation positive. One response to anger is often anger on the part of us. We, we simply, when dealt with ang in an angry manner, we tend to react to people that way. Um, there is a lesson in there in dealing with, with salespeople, for instance, or waiters or waitresses. And that is, if you start with a chip on your shoulder, you're very likely to en engender a, a chip on their shoulder. They'll give you an in-your-face kind of, kind of response. But a second thing to do is, is perhaps assert yourself but think a little bit about how you're going to do that, okay? It's better to strongly disapprove of something and ask someone to change than it is to simply yell at them, to threaten them, to insult them, to attack them. Um, substitute assertion for aggression is what I'm arguing there. The assertion is, is more positively oriented. It's moving toward, you know, you are expressing in some clear way that you've been disappointed in that situation. Um, I had somebody in my office yesterday who came in talking on a cell phone, which I annoys the heck out of me anyway. If, 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 you, if you took the time to interrupt me, at least be ready to talk to me when you get there. Don't expect me to sit there in my office, having been interrupted from what I'm doing, to listen to you concluding a cell phone call at the end. And what this person did was simply put it, put it down at their side. There was no indication in the conversation that they'd stop the conversation. And so after I dealt with whatever the question was that they were asking, I simply took that point to go right into, it would be more helpful uh, to my welfare in the future if you would conclude a conversation before you start. And for me, it makes me feel uncomfortable if you simply put your phone down without having finished the conversation, because I have no idea as a Texas U of H representative who's listening in. And I may be teasing people about various kinds of things, which really, as for people who know me, are, are not something that I'm, I'm particularly vindictive about, uh, whatever the topic happens to be. Um, but somebody who only hears that snatch of conversation may form a very unreal impression of me over which I've had no control or awareness at all. So I think it would be better in general when you're visiting people if you don't have your cell phone active at a given time. And that was an example of, of where, it, I, it was, as I noticed it, I. I it, it kind of limited what I was saying, or the, the kind of bombastic way in which I tend to react to people. Um, but it was simply an expression of, of the uncomfort that I felt when they walked in with what was essentially a live phone, talking to somebody that was not introduced to me that I had no idea um, regarding and, and so forth. Um, the third thing is that when you get through this kind of a situation, you need to reward yourself. Um, essentially, when, when you handle anger properly, you should compliment yourself afterwards. The bottom line here is, is essentially control yourself to control others and the world. Don't let them do it for you. Because essentially, if, if somebody comes into you in a bombastic manner and you react to them in the same way, you've immediately jumped the, the overall exchange level intensity um, in a way that may be unnecessary. It, it detracts from your ability to hear what they're saying, react to it rationally, and so forth. Um, if I get to sounding too much like a mother or a father, let me know. Uh, all I'm doing is citing the literature to you in this case. We are in a psychology course. Um, Let's look at that in another way, and that is essentially, what is our own view of how we react in, in given situations? And there's an interesting kind of literature that has, has traced from the, the initial introduction of this concept by Albert Bandura a third of a century ago or so. Um, and essentially, uh, essentially, the point to be made about self-efficacy is that one effective means by which to, to resist or cope with stress is to have high expectations about your own ability level um, in dealing with it to deal with stressors. Um, 
And when you're stressed significantly, less adrenaline appears in the bloodstream of people who have high expectations of their own self-efficacy. That is, people who walk around with, with an, a view of themselves that they are able to handle stressful situations, uh, a rational view. Um, the net result is that when a stressor does hit them, the hormones that flow into the bloodstream are not as present, not as, not as significantly present as they are in, in the bloodstreams of, of people with low self-expectations of, of being an effective reactor to this. Um, and so the effects of adrenaline, as you know, are things like high drive, shakiness or nervousness that happens. Um, butterflies where? In the tummy. Okay, those are symptoms that are common in all of us. When the adrenaline goes up, there are certain predictable things that will happen in a given situation. Um, and so those with, with high views of self-efficacy are, are actually under less self-generated stress when they are confronted by an environmental stressor of one sort or another. Um, and so those with, with um, expectations of, of high self-efficacy perform better than those who have expectations of low self-efficacy in, in a given situation. And those with the high levels um, engage or regulate their own problem-solving behavior more effectively across a wide variety of experimental demonstrations than do, than do those who have low expect expectancy of, of self-efficacy. That's a lot to say. I couldn't figure out any way to say that without getting tongue-tied in terms of self-efficacy expectations. But that's what we're dealing with. Having a positive view of your own self-efficacy clearly helps. It makes you feel better and it makes you conscious of, of dealing with how you react in given situations. It can be very helpful. Um, I said I would come back to this and, and here's the point at which we're going to do so. And that is another way in which to deal with cope with, with stressful situations is to use humor. Um, Rathus and Nevid, uh, in a study back in the middle of the 1990s, offer significant evidence in support of an old biblical proverb um, having to do with um, pleasantness and, and positive attitude. Do you have any idea what it is? I had to be reminded of this one, but it's, it's essentially a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, which comes from, from uh, Proverbs uh, 17, 22nd uh, verse that's involved there. Rather interesting ways to illustrate this. And, and it, is a, it, it seems like such a global statement, but it turns out to be fairly easy to document. I'll give you just one example that you may or may not remember from, from your own past. There was a gentleman by the name of Norman Cousins who encountered a serious bout or, or endured a serious bout with cancer um, when he was, uh, ba sorry, back in, I start to say when he was, but when, back in 1979. He was actually born in 15, so he would have been, what, 64 at the time that happened, that it happened. And he developed on his own a really interesting strategy, and that is as, as he talked to people afterwards, what he reported was that 10 minutes of serious belly laughter could produce two hours of anesthetic-free comfortable sleep. Now that's kind of an interesting observation, particularly for someone who was, yes, an intellectual giant, um, an, an eternal optimist, uh, uh, a heavy thinker at, at, uh, with Harvard connections and so forth, uh, but he was really struck down by the cancer when it hit and it became a, a kind of a national um, bit of concern to kind of watch what happened and, and he was in the optimism. He was very much a, a in favor of, of humor as, a, as an effective treatment. Um, and the net result is, as I found in, in the literature, I was always curious as to what actually happened. And what I discovered is that the result of having encountered that serious bout in 1979 and dealing with, with humor was that he added another decade to his life. I mean, he lived 11 more years after the time of that cancer. And one of the major things he did was simply take a no holds barred, very positive view toward it. He set himself up in situations where he would actively laugh for at least 10 minutes several times during the day. And he deliberately did so. Uh, I was reminded in, in the, uh, the, I've raised three children now, and one of the strategies that I found as a parent works very effectively is when somebody is particularly grumpy, um, what you do is simply the, the punishment that you give them is they have to smile. Well, I don't feel like smiling. Well, I'm going to ask you to smile. And, and it's amazing that when, they have to, when they're forced to pull their lips up and, and put a smile on their face, it's very difficult to be angry or in a nasty mood at the same time that you're actually smiling at people. And it works. I mean, it, it's such a subtle change in, in forcing them to say, I don't care whether you believe it, I just want you to smile. I want to grin on your face for the next five minutes. 
and it does amazing things to give them time. You know, they have to concentrate, given how bad they feel, they have to concentrate so long on, I have to smile, um, that in fact it will turn their mood around and, and uh, significantly improve them in that way. But in any case, um, Humor might produce um, a number of different ideas here. I'm going to try a joke, which I actually heard on Garrison Keillor's uh, show the other night. The, the timing of it is, is a little bit critical, so I apologize beforehand if it doesn't work. I've got a, a, um, a follow-up if this one doesn't work, but hang with me here for a minute. The story was that, that there were, in fact, three um, members of, of Western Europe, um, an Irishman, a Scotsman, and a Brit, as it turns out, who were good friends in London a um, couple of years ago, well, a decade or no, a couple of years ago. Um, and they took it upon themselves on one Friday evening of, of drinking that since the, the Olympics were going on at that time in, in Beijing, they really wanted to go. They were sports nuts anyway because of the big TVs in the bar and so forth. And they just took it upon themselves to see if they could get to the Olympics, kind of a, a, a self-generated um, effort. And lo and behold, they were able to. They had the, the forethought to, to make reservations for themselves. They were able to find hotels, a little bit fringy in Beijing, but they were in fact able to find rooms for the three of them. So they hopped on a plane, found a nice um, London-Beijing link and got over and were able to get back uh, fairly easily. And it was only the morning of, uh, of their first day in Beijing headed to the Olympics when they suddenly had a head slapper in which they realized, we don't have tickets. We have no way to get into the Olympic Stadium. What are we going to do? And the Irishman, prone to dealing with this kind of problem, uh, as they were walking up to the gate, kind of looked at the, the construction, the riffraff that had been left in, as they were building the, the stadium complex there. And he noticed a rather long pole down on the, over on the grass and beside, uh, off the road at some point. And he picked it up because in, in, uh, they had decided that the only way they were going to be able to get in was to appear as athletes and, they, so they could dress that way, but they still had to get through the gate. And so the, the Irishman was the first one to pro approach the gate with this pole, which he picked up. And so he walked in uh, toward the gate and, and the, um, the, the uh, guard looked at him, and the Irishman said simply, pole vault. And since he was carrying this long stick dressed in gym shorts, the guy opened the gate, and he went right in. So now there were two of them, the Scotsman and the, and the, the Brit, still having to get in. So the, the Scotsman looked a little desperate for a minute, but as he looked around on the road, he realized that there were a number of different access holes that had been covered over with metal plates, um, where there were things where they had to reach in just to get a hand in to turn pipes on or off or something like that. So he picked up one of these, these black plastic discs or iron discs that covered the, the hole and took it in with it in his hand, in his, in his gym shorts, and when he got to the gate, he simply said, um, essentially, discus. Um, the guy opened the door and, and he went right in. This left the Brit still outside, still needing to get through the gate, and as he looked around to see what else was there, he realized that there was some, some uh, I think detritus is the word, but some leftovers from the, um, from the construction, and there, there was this, this wrap of, of uh, wire that had not been used in, in generating the, the, um, the, the surrounding thing to, to protect the, the whole area. And so he picked up this roll of coiled wire and headed toward the gate, full of confidence with us, um, and when he gets to the gate, he turns to the guardsman and he says, fencing. Two, three, four. You have to think about that one a little bit, but I liked it as I thought about it. I'll stick with that. In any case, I've got a marginal one I can tell you after class if you want, but I decided it might not be ethical to do here, so we'll keep it clean. But in any case, um, if you think back, See, there's still grins occurring in the room. You have to think about that one a minute. Um, in essence, um, if you think back to the Holmes and Ra study, it was basically a survey. We talked about it in Elsewhere or Will. I don't remember whether it fits before or after in the course, but he, they did a, a, a readjustment rating scale, essentially, um, that had to do with um, a whole series of numbered events where you, if you deal with the, the worst crisis, it would be in, in a marital situation, something like the death of a spouse. That's kind of the ultimate bad event in a given situation. And then it ranked downward from that to about 45 points worth of, of annoyance caused by a, a given situation. Um, and in essence, what they, what they were able to do was to, to demonstrate a significant correlation between the impact, the, the magnitude of negative events in life, and the, the resulting stresses that occurred in that situation. And if, if, as it worked out with the numbering scheme that they used, if you ended up over 300 in terms of total points of, of annoyance that is, has occurred, there is a significant positive correlation with the likelihood that you'll get ill. 
as a result of it, if you experience too many negative events, such as where the most extreme event is, is uh, the death of a spouse, uh, say a 75-pointer is divorce and, and various other things like that, that if you mount up uh, more than about 300 points of those kinds of annoyances in a, in a, um, a one-year period of time, the odds go way up that in fact illness will be one of the other things that you have to deal with in, in that situation. Um, Martin and, and Lefcourt um, showed that, that in fact college students who express humor, uh, particularly under high stress conditions, were markedly less susceptible to, to il illness. I, I've shown you that graph in, in another context uh, earlier. But in essence, the summary is very easy. Humor helps. The proverb is in fact correct. Um, another feature that, that uh, amazes me in terms of how insensitive some people are to it is predictability. If you're going to be hurt, um, would you rather know when it's going to come and be able to control it, its occurrence, that is when it will occur, or would you rather simply let it happen, let it happen when it may? And in fact, the data on that is quite clear. And that is that in general, predictability is much preferred and it's better on us. Um, predictable stressors um, have much less impact on us than do unpredictable stressors. Um, but predictability is of more help to those with an internal locus of control than with an external locus of control. That concept of internal external locus of control keeps coming up over and over in this situation. And I really think it bears directly on, on the issue of coping that we're kind of generally addressing here right now. I know in my own life I have diabetes and therefore I, I run uh, um, blood tests at various times. And, and it usually involves just a very thin uh, pointer that goes into the, the, uh, your finger so that you can squeeze it and drop a little drop of blood to do a, a blood sugar test. Uh, and I do that like four times a day, so I'm pretty skilled at doing it and knowing how to do it. And one of the things that amazes me is the medical people will often take one of those, those things that creates the, the hole in you and they'll do it right in the middle of your finger. Do not let them do that. Because in essence, the, the tips of your fingers are the most sensitive points in your, among the most sensitive points in your body. So what you really want to do is to put the pricker over on the side. And if you do that, yeah, but at least you control when it's going to happen. In fact, when, when a nurse comes up to me for that kind of a thing, I simply ask to take the, the thing. I have no problem giving the blood, but I want to have control about exactly when I'm pushing that button and so forth. And the issue of predictability um, associated with some knowledge of where the touch sensors are greatest can be very helpful in that kind of a situation. Another one, and this may sound kind of goofy, but it actually turns out to be very important, is social support as another way in which to aid the, the coping that we engage in. Um, James House identified actually four different aspects of social support that can help us in coping with the various stressors to which we um, get subjected at various times. One of these turns out to be information. If you think about uh, our city being uh, coastal, we do in fact occasionally face hurricanes and, and um, um, all the different efforts that we have to go through to, to deal with them. But, but essentially, um, every time we have a flood or a hurricane or anything like that, think about one of the first things you tend to do is to tune into the local news radio. Okay, you want to find out, you want to gain information about the impact in terms of where's the eye hitting, what is, you know, which is the bad side, will I be on it or not, and that in some ways governs what you end up doing relative to do you need to move the garbage cans in, do you have to tie the car down, you know, whatever is involved. But information is one of the keys that aids in coping in that situation. Uh, a second one is the idea of appraisal. That is, what the, what the radio and television folks do for us is to essentially lend, lend context, lend appraisal value to the magnitude of the storm itself. I mean, the very idea that we have hurricanes labeled from one to five is essentially an appraisal statement relative to the magnitude of the hurricane itself, and thus the, the likely to be associated uh, damage that may be caused by it in, in a given situation. And so in essence, appraisal is a second factor. Knowledge of that is very helpful, and it often comes from the social support network that we generate around ourselves. Um, a third thing is, is instrumental aid. Uh, this one takes a little bit longer to kick in in a given situation, but if you think about the, the, um, the last hurricane which, which struck the, the heart of Louisiana and, and raised a lot of difficulties through not only through government ineptitude but just the lack of general preparation for the magnitude of the storm that plowed in through uh, New Orleans and that area, um, one of the most effective governmental uh, aids that followed was essentially trailers. 
they, they moved in thousands of trailers. Short-term solution, it turns out now we've got problems with the manufactured equipment, the equipment that was used to manufacture it or the materials that were used to manufacture it. But the whole idea of, of low interest or long-term loans is very much a part of, of the best way to help people in coping. Um, and that's a place where our government does in fact typically play a, a significant role. And the final thing is that in addition to, to instrumental aid itself, we end up socializing about it. We talk about it. You think about uh, therapeutically, if you end up, in, and all of us have gone through this at one time or another, your boyfriend or girlfriend changes his or her mind about you. They walk away, they, they break the relationship, and that's devastating for the person who is ultimately deserted. Uh, not so much for the person who's walked away because they have control over it. It was them that determined, A, that it isn't working, B, I need to end this, and therefore they decide, they exercise control in that case of, over when the situation's going to happen. But the key for somebody who is left behind is to talk about it. That's a very helpful device. Share with other people who can, who can uh, appraise the, the relative magnitude um, of, the, of the disaster for you. And, and um, in fact, in sharing that knowledge verbally, it ultimately helps you get over the hurdle of, of dealing with the, the negativity that's generated there. And the, the positive goes in another, in another direction, but similarly too, and that is um, think about how much fun it is to go to the Galleria at Christmas time. Um, not that you have to be Christian to be there, but simply the idea that uh, there are a lot of people there. They're engaged in, in buying things for other people, which is the tradition of that holiday, and that's a very positive kind of event. And the more people you get within limits, the more people you get into that kind of a situation, the happier it ends up becoming. And the, the net result is that, that, that uh, the shopping season that's wrapped around Christmas ends up being the high market season for, for many businesses. Some businesses do as much as 70% of their total business <coughs> excuse me, in December. So again, the, the, the basic issue there is crowds. The fact that you know it's a common holiday, we talk about it, we analyze it, we socialize around it, and so forth. All of those are factors that, that lend to the power of, of social support. And then we get into another amazingly far-reaching activity. I'm going to spend a bit of time on, on this one because it, it's, it's, as I started looking at, at the, the literature and generating what I wanted to talk about today, um, it turns out to reach a, a phenomenal distance as, as an overall activity. Now, what do I mean? I decided I'll start simply here. How am I going to define the term that I really mean here? And so if we look at relaxation, um, there are a number of different definitions of, of this term that can be offered, and I'll just throw them out here for you. Don't write them all down. I don't want you to do that. But state of being relaxed is one of the ways. That's not a particularly helpful demonstration um, or definition. At least I didn't find it to be so. Or the act of relaxing. Well, big deal. We still haven't defined what we mean by relax. Um, refreshment of body or mind. Well, that's getting a little closer to what I really had in mind as a gut level definition of what's meant by, by relaxation. But we can also toss in things like a loosening or a slackening, which is what happens with rules sometimes, that they get relaxed in a given situation. Uh, it's not directly relevant to what we're talking about, but it's clearly a use of and meaning of relaxation, or a reduction in strictness or severity. Different definition of, of the same idea. Getting a little closer is this one, essentially the lengthening of inactive muscles. In your legs, for instance, you stretch them out and then just literally relax. You, you tense them to, the, to their maximum length or stretch them out and then take the pressure off and relax. And as, as I thought about it, the way that I thought was, was more preferable to define it was essentially to think about it essentially as a reduction of energy dedicated to maintaining body tension. And the more I thought about that as a, as a kind of a summary definition of what we're talking about, the more I liked it. And, and in essence, when we talk about energy, we can talk about physical energy when you're dealing with physical efforts you're now backing away from, or psychological pressures that we put on ourselves. In both cases, I think it's handled by that definition. So let's operate with that, essentially, that we will define relaxation as, as simply a reduction of energy dedicated to maintaining body tension. And in turn, then, that leads us directly into one of the things that we can talk about simply because it so directly ties to relaxation. In fact, I'm going to end up posing an intellectual argument with the people who are campaigning for, for meditation in ways that will develop here in, in the next couple of minutes. Um, as you know, um, one of the keys to, to doing this, as we now know, is we've gained knowledge about what's involved in, in meditation is the idea that um, you really have to, whoops, I didn't mean to tap that yet because I'm not ready to talk about problems. What I want to do is talk first of all about things like alpha waves. 
the ability of our brain uh, in terms of EEG pattern to, to generate significant electrical activity cycling at about 8 to 13 times per second. That's the technical definition of an alpha wave. It's usually produced in the relaxed state just prior to going to sleep. Many of, in fact, all of us produce alpha waves and we put ourselves into a situation to do so and we're not aware of it simply because we're not focused on it. And that was one of the, the valuable contributions of those who focus specifically on meditation as a skill. But if you simply lie down with the idea, when you go to bed with the idea of going to sleep at night, what you do is, is eventually relax enough to, to let go of, of the, the things that have, you've been working on that very day, uh, the problems that you have and so forth. But in essence, the relaxed state is accompanied by a growth in alpha waves. And when you're in stage one sleep, stage one sleep of the four that's involved is actually loaded with alpha waves. You're, you're producing a phenomenal number of, of alpha waves in that situation. It turns out that by providing you with some overt signals related to the presence of alpha waves, we can actually get you to create, we can lead you into being able to create your own alpha state which does not necessarily mean that you have to go to sleep. Simply to be in an alpha state is not meaning that you're, you're uh, one step shy of sleep in that situation. Um, the process of putting yourself into an alpha state means that you are essentially meditating. When you voluntarily put yourself into um, alpha state, where that's the maximum way of being generated, you have essentially voluntarily put yourself into alpha state. The question then is it seems in some ways to be directly related to sleep. And the answer is distinctly no, it is not directly related to sleep. Our brains use the same waves or generate the same waves in different situations. But it doesn't mean that when you're meditating you're going to sleep at all. Um, it does, however, produce distinct physiological changes. By it I mean um, meditation itself. Um, essentially produces distinct physiological states. Um, it involves, for instance, concentrating of your attention order, in order to produce that state. Which, and it's, it's, um, it's hard to describe to the uninitiated, but it, it says the, the mental state that's involved is essentially described as non-competitive, lucid, and detached. It is reported to be a generally very, you'll hear me using words like this because I have never meditated myself, so I'm talking uh, about the unknown in terms of my personal life. But from the literature, uh, that is the way it's usually described. And people who have meditated profess a significant difficulty in really communicating the essence of what a good, positive, med meditative state really feels like. Um, from a research perspective, now we do get to the, uh, to the problems here. Um, there turn out to be two major problems when we start trying to study meditation as an independent phenomenon. One is a definitional problem, and that is there are actually a number of different uh, states that can be described, although what I was leading up to there is essentially a describing of yoga translated as union, which is essentially a, a higher consciousness as described by meditators, which is achieved through a fully rested and relaxed body and a fully awake, relaxed mind. Now that, in one sense, almost seems like a, like a controversion or, or a conflict in terms, being awake and yet being relaxed mentally, um, is essentially what meditators are, are asking us to, to achieve. But what's the, how do we define that independently from the outside as psychologists? That's the problem. Essentially, what do we really mean by, by um, yoga in a given situation? And the other problem that we have is one of, of not just definitions, but of techniques. Uh, and there turn out to be many different ways in which to achieve yoga. Um, the specific one that I'm going to use here or talk about is essentially transcendental meditation. And I'm choosing it for, for a couple of reasons. But there turn out to be several different techniques, all of which are essentially effective in achieving this, this um, state defined as yoga, the meditative state. The classic study in this, and, and I don't think I'm, I'm uh, out of bounds in saying this, was conducted by Wallace and Benson, um, originally reported back in 1972 in the Scientific American. So the study I'm going to talk about here is about 35, 38 years old, but it's a classic in the field because it was really the first central attempt to scientifically define what is the meditative state, what, what happens to us physiologically when we're meditating. And so in this particular situation, the experimental si the, the process that they used was a standard session that involved four specific phases. 
one of which was, was essentially uh, the first 30 minutes or so was one of habituation. Um, you might define that essentially as pre-relaxation, uh, essentially an attempt to just calm down. You kind of slow yourself down from whatever you've been in the midst of, rushing to get to this two-hour experiment. So they sat you down and had you sit for 30 minutes and just habituate. You and I might prefer to call it relaxation, but that's what the first 30 minutes was. No attempt to control what was going on, simply relaxing. The next 20 or 30 minutes was a phase that they label as, as essentially pre-meditation. And by that, what they were defining was essentially a quiet state where the relaxation is a, a focal point, but it is pre-meditative. That is, they're not specifically trying to get people to move into a meditative state at, at this particular time. There is, what follows then is a 20 or 30 minute interval of, of actual meditation uh, in whatever form is being used uh, in this particular study followed then by a 20 or 30 minute post meditative state. It's interesting that they even put that in because in, so on, in one way you simply reach a decision to stop meditating, go through the, the process of kind of reestablishing contact with reality and walk off. Well they formalized that and, and had a specific 20 or 30 minute interval of simply post meditation. Um, the, the subject at, the, at this point to initiate this state was a simply asked, was essentially asked to stop meditating. That defined the, the beginning of the, of the post meditative state. Now the experiments that they did uh, were built around uh, a very complex series of, of results which they generated, uh, but um, in particular, there were several factors which they measured in this, uh, in this situation um, that, that are worth mentioning. One is alpha waves. That is, they measured the, the um, efficacy of, the, um, of, the, um, of the, the brain waves, the production of actual alpha waves in, in this situation um, prior to the, the um, prior to the, the, uh, the, sorry, while the experiment was going on. Um, the second thing they did was to also measure oxygen level. This was done by actually monitoring the blood. That is what we're looking at is the amount of oxygen present in the blood at a, at a given situation. The third thing that they also did was to measure the amount of CO2 in the, uh, in the blood itself um, as, the, as the person was, was, um, was meditating. And finally then, we also measured the, the galvanic skin response. Well, it was, it was more than that, actually. They measured uh, blood pressure. They measured the beat rate of the, of the heart itself. They measured temperature rectally. I don't know why that was necessary in a study of meditation, but it was temperature, body temperature. And then, of course, the, the skin resistance of the, of the GSR and, and so forth. The results were rather interesting. What they found was that in terms of alpha waves, when going to sleep, those reach a peak during the, the, the stage one, the first phase, but as you move into stage two, when you're beginning to move toward delta waves and, and the, the sleep spindles and everything else that applies, the, or that occurs, the alpha waves disappear. They drop out entirely during the, the, the more advanced stages of sleep. By contrast, in transcendental meditation, what they found, and this was the first time it was formally noted, um, was a marked increase in, in the presence of alpha waves. It was clear that the subject could voluntarily put themselves into this, as it's now called, alpha state. Oxygen dropped. It dropped after several hours in sleep, which I'll explain here in just a minute. It dropped in the first five or 10 minutes during transcendental meditation. By contrast, the amount of CO2 in the blood actually increased um, during sleep, and in fact it decreased during transcendental meditation. If we look at galvanic skin response, a measure of, of electrical resistance in, in, the, um, in, the, in the skin itself, um, that drops, but not so far and not so fast when you're, when you're asleep as it does in the first five or 10 minutes when you're meditating. Out of this, there was one big surprise. The, the one major finding for which this study is best known that they were not prepared for is number one there. And that is the fact that the alpha waves drop out when you go to sleep. On the other hand, they actually increase during the course of, of meditation as, for example, in transcendental meditation. Um, otherwise, there was no particular major difference between uh, being asleep and awake. There are minor differences. The, the, the drop in oxygen and the, the increase in, or, the, or the decrease in CO2, uh, the, the contrast here between the, the, uh, when you're asleep as opposed to when you're in meditation is explained by the fact that in transcendental meditation, it is thought that your basic metabolic rate drops 
that is an, one of the acts of, of relaxing, of meditating, is essentially that the basic metabolic rate drops. And that's why in transcendental meditation, both the amount of oxygen and the amount of CO2 in the blood goes down significantly because your basic rate of metabolizing uh, the energy that you previously absorbed itself goes down. Um, and so in this particular situation, the question then is, and I want to come back to problems, because um, David Holmes at the University of Kansas raised a major one. That is, Wallace and Benson's work came out in 72, and there was a lot of activity built around the study of transcendental meditation um, in the 70s and the early 80s. It was fascinating when I was putting this together that I spent a good bit of time in the literature looking through um, what's happened. And I'll show you some rather interesting changes that took place in, in uh, Benson's approach to the world. And it was generated, I'm sure, by the, by the counter-reaction of David Holmes. Essentially what Holmes did at the University of Kansas was to invite people in um, to, to relax. He essentially uh, brought in a large number of undergraduates from the introductory psychology course at, at um, Kansas and had them simply sit down and do nothing. They literally had to relax. Now, if you think about it a minute, you and I don't tend to do that. We, you know, we get done with this class, we go to the next class, or we get done with this class, we go to lunch, or we get done with, there's something to do immediately when you get out of here. There's no problem clearing the room when the lecture is done. You're always headed somewhere, okay? Holmes simply added a block of time where the, the reaction was, you're here, relax. Okay? They were given easy things to do or nothing, just literally relax. And then he measured a variety of things, not rectally, but in fact measured body temperature. Uh, he measured heart rate. He measured blood pressure. He measured the presence of sweaty palms and so forth and so on. And what he came out with was essentially the, a, a documentable assertion that in fact there is no physiological difference between somebody who is in alpha state and meditating as opposed to somebody who is simply relaxing. And his point was two or threefold, the, the primary one being what I led into this with, and that is the fact that you and I basically don't relax during the day. We do not typically do so. And in this case, he simply added a block of time when people are going to slow down. And well, sure enough, it turns out the body responds in that way exactly to, to in parallel with what happens when you're, when you're meditating very controversial at the time. But then when you look at it, it turns out that this concept of relaxation has been around for quite a while. To meditate, I forgot I wanted to show you how to do that. Give me a second here. What you're going to do when you try to meditate is, is several different things. First of all, what you want to do is to avoid stimulants. They say one hour, two hours is probably better. Stay away from coffee. In fact, some would advise that you don't eat at all. Have your stomach done with whatever you put in in the last meal and relax. Okay, first thing you do is, is to relax. And the second thing you have to do is to accept the fact that like sleep, you can't lie down and will yourself to sleep. You literally have to slow down enough to let it happen. It overtakes you. The meditative state is the same way. You can structure the world so that you will end up in, in alpha state, but you don't just tell yourself to snap a finger and start alpha production. It doesn't work that way. The third thing you do is find a quiet, not overly bright environment, somewhere you can just calm down and relax for a while. You adopt a very passive attitude toward where you are. Find a physically comfortable position, physically, whether you're sitting in a chair and leaning back, lying down, whatever. Focus on an internal mantra of some sort. That is essentially a word that has special meaning to you, but your goal is not to say it, but rather to experience it. And that, that's a kind of a subtle distinction that I'm making there. You're not expected to say that word over and over and over again, but to contemplate it and essentially to experience whatever that word draws forth for you in that kind of a situation. Don't fight disruptions while you're meditating. Just let them happen and pass on to whatever is the next activity that you're, that you're um, it will pass back into the meditative state in that case. What you're essentially encouraged to do is let go of control. Don't try to actively control what's going on. You're simply allowing yourself to drift. I want to lead from that into a return back about two thirds of a century. I want to go back to some work that was done back in 1938 uh, called Progressive Relaxation by Jacobson. I do that simply to point out the amazing parallel that I'm going to show you here in just a second. And that is that the Jacobson did a significant study of, of um, progressive relaxation. And in that case, it's based on the idea of progressively relaxing, uh, sorry, progressively tensing and experiencing 
what your body is like, kind of like what I described earlier when, when you're kind of tight as you're, as you're waking up, um, and then relaxing and deliberately experiencing what you have to tell your body to do to experience that, that state of, of relaxation. So essentially, one way to do this for yourself is record, or even better, have someone with a pleasant voice, or a voice that you find pleasant, whether male or female, record the instructions like what I'm gonna give you here in, in just a minute. Um, I had this set up so I could, I could give you 10 minutes of relaxation if necessary. We don't have time for that. Um, but in any case, uh, in essence, what you do in, in accord with this is, is basically to, to um, take that tape turn it on, having it pre-recorded, and then simply listen to it and try to follow it to the extent you can. So what you're gonna have is a recorded tape of instructions on the systematic process of relaxing in that situation. And what you're supposed to do, according to Jacobson, is focus on relaxing. And then what you should also do is experience the difference between when you're in a tense state as opposed to when you're in that relaxed state, okay? And so listen now to the similarity here. I, I gave you earlier the instructions on, on meditation, but listen to what, what Jacobson is recommending. He's recommending that you find a comfortable position in which you can relax as comfortably as possible with as few distractions as you can achieve. Concentrate on the voice of instructions that you're listening to and try to follow the suggestions. And basically, you're asked, are you relaxed? Are you ready? Okay. To relax, you're going to try this. They're going to stick on this screen so you don't have to worry about focusing on the screen. We're just going to stay on that for a minute, so don't worry about it. Um, what you do is take two or three de uh, breaths, deep breaths, and then we pause for about 10 seconds. I'm giving you the instructions, now. I don't want you to actually do this. Um, then what you do is to clench your fists and lower your arms, essentially clench them and, and then lower them and make them tight enough so that you can feel the difference and it kind of the lactic acid is going to build up. You'll feel the pain in the muscles if you were to retain that for you know, a minute or two in this case. Experience what that tension feels like. Feel the tension not only in your fists but also in your arms and concentrate for a moment on the, atten on the tension. And then relax your hands, relax your arms. Experience what you had to tell your body to do in order to achieve that relaxed state. Experience how your hands, your wrists, your arms feel in the relaxed state. Feel the relaxation. And do that for 10 seconds. Again, clinch your fists and lower your arms. Clinch your fists as tightly together as you can. Try to create that pain and experience what the tension feels like. What you're telling your body to do to create the tension and then the experience that you get out of it. Now relax your arms and essentially back through the same process again. Experience how you feel as you relax and the muscles that you had, or, or the responses you had to give to yourself to do that. And what you do is to repeat that process by clenching your teeth together, tip your head back and make it as tight as, you know, you're essentially doing neck and up and make it as tense as possible. And go through that process of, of activating it and then relaxing several times. Pull your shoulders forward in this way. Tense up your tummy muscles and your shoulders and make it as tight as possible. Pull your shoulders forward and tense your muscles, your, your stomach, I mean. Take three deep breaths and hold your third deep breath to feel the tension in your chest and your tummy. Push down on your heels and raise your toes so that your feet, your toes, and your calves, the calves of your legs feel the tension. And the same process. Create the tension, understand how you did it, and then back off from it and pay attention to how you backed off from it. Okay? You can go on with that as long as you wish. What I'm going to do is to conclude this section and get into another really fun section here in just a minute with three observations. Nietzsche said essentially, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I never knew where that quote came from, but it's a kind of an interesting one relative to the coping that we're talking about here. Pogo says, we have met the enemy and he is us. With respect to coping, I think Jean Berlin had, had a, a good phrase, and that was essentially, the worst obstacle is our own self-limiting beliefs. And I found another one by, by St. Augustine that I wanted to offer for you too, which I think really hits the nail on the head, and that is, and it's sexist, and I, I, I apologize for that, but when you realize it was done in 300 AD, there's maybe some reason for it. But in any case, what he said was, how a man rallies to life's challenges and weathers its storms tells everything of who he is and all that he is likely to become. 
which is a kind of an interesting summary of what we're talking about, but I wanted to summarize it in a different way with a guest who's with us today, Dr. Kate Swan from our own Shaw. counseling. Shaw. I knew I was going to screw that up. I practiced it and I still practice it wrong. Kate Shaw, uh, who is with us today, one of the, one of the um, how many people do you have in, in the counseling center? 15? Yeah, yeah, about 15. Offering help. Absolutely. And that's basically what we're going to talk about today here. And I wanted to pick up on a favorite of mine, probably also a favorite of yours, and that is test anxiety. How would you, what kind of advice would you give to a student at the University of Houston if they start getting all wound up inside when they face a test? Sure. How do they deal with it? I think test anxiety is a very common concern among students and one of the first things I would recommend is that your studying should mimic the test environment as much as possible. So I'll give you an example of that. Let's say you're taking a math test and you know you're going to have to do 10 math problems in this set period of time. So you know that each problem you can only spend so much time on it before you got to move on to the next one if you hope to finish the test. So from that standpoint it helps in your studying if you can time yourself while doing math problems. That was going to be the best way to prepare yourself for that actual testing environment. So let's say I'm, I know I'm going to have to do 10 math problems in 50 minutes, that gives me 5 minutes per problem. I'm going to study by only allowing myself 5 minutes per problem. And if you can get used to that, the testing environment is going to be a lot less anxiety provoking because you've mimicked that situation outside of the testing environment. Now another um, place where test anxiety comes up is for standardized tests such as the GRE, the MCAT, and things like that. Um, and again, I think mimicking the testing environment is important. So if you just think of the situation that you're going to be in when you take those kind of tests, you're going to be in this computer center um, with a lot of other people. There might be a lot of noise going on. It's just going to be you in a little cubicle with a computer. So I would recommend in that case, when you're taking your practice test for the MCAT or the GRE or what have you, you go to the library, there's lots of other people around, you sit at a computer lab and you take the practice test there. So you're used to doing it in a place that's not your home where you're nice and comfortable and you can stop and you know get a snack or take a bathroom break whenever you want to, no other people around to distract or you're used to doing it in an environment where there's lots of other things going on in your outside of your comfort zone. Um, I think something else that can help is that I've noticed with folks with test anxiety, when they get into the classroom, they look at the whole test at once. They flip through and look at everything. That can be very overwhelming, right? You're looking at it as one big chunk rather than as, as little steps that you need to get through. So if that's a problem for you, I would recommend not looking ahead at the test, just looking at it one question at a time and going from there and not allowing yourself to flip to the end of the test. Another thing that can help is relaxation techniques. Just like the progressive muscle relaxation you were talking about, that's a great one. Also diaphragmatic breathing. If you can really get your breath down into your belly, slow it down, that's going to help calm your body down as well. So I think so those are some of the, the main things I would recommend for testing. Okay. Yeah. Gee, if I could just retake the GRE now, it would be helpful. <laughs> Another question that I often get asked and, or observe in people is, is a difficulty in balancing off the social relations with the school needs, mm -hmm. or in our case of, of our student body, the work demands, uh, sure. school and, and social needs. How do, you, how do you factor in relationships um, in, in the overall complex of what we're doing here at the university? Sure. I think um, from the perspective of a psychologist, what's healthiest is having some sort of balance between social time relationships and your work. Now that's an ideal that we can all strive for and that's not something you can always achieve, but um, I think it's going to be good for you as well as whoever you're dating to carve out some time where you're just focusing on that relationship. You're not studying, you're not doing schoolwork. Now that may not always be realistic. Let's say you're pre-med and you have to spend all your time studying. Um, well, I think in that instance, it's still important to carve out a little bit of time for you. But let's say you're in a relationship with someone who's a little more demanding on your time. And, and they're not really adjusting so well to you having to spend all your time doing schoolwork. Well, um, in an extreme case, that could be a time to reevaluate that relationship. Is this someone who can, who's going to foster my goals? Is this someone who wants me to succeed in my endeavors, who wants me to, to you know, get into medical school and put in the time that I need to to get where I want to be? Um, so in an extreme case, you may reevaluate the relationship, decide maybe it's not for you. Um, but I think also just talking to whoever you're dating about the situation that you're in, you know, telling them that, this is good for both of you in the long term. And I think 
you know, just opening those lines of communication, making sure they know how much time you need to devote to your studies, but also carving out time. So it can take a little more planning than maybe you'd like, but say, all right, I need to spend all this week studying, but this Saturday night is just going to be us. And really putting away all of the books, all your study materials, and trying to just focus on that person. Oh. It's interesting. I, I jump out of uh, context here for a minute to indicate that I have two cats um, who like to be petted. And the problem that I ran into was that they're jealous. One of them gets petted, the other one's got his face right in there to make sure that he gets strokes also. And the solution that I've found that tends to keep them happy and me more sane is that I have now isolated a time when because of their different activities, they tend to be in slightly different places in the house. And I will be with the one cat isolated for a while. And, and with the one that reminded me specifically of it is that when I take a shower in the morning, one of the two cats tends to be there watching the water and, and the various activities that are going on. And so I simply, as a matter of case, will now simply pick him up and scratch his tummy, which he loves. Uh, it only takes about two minutes, but I've noticed now, he's about six, seven years old, that when I start moving toward the bathroom, he's already going to the place where he sits on the carpet to be picked up. So the, 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 uh, the, the building of one's relationship is important in, in the way you're describing it, in that you're interacting with somebody who can, who can be equally responsible for, for helping you get to the, the status that you want yeah. in, in um, distribution of time. Absolutely. I think as you point out there, it doesn't take that much time, but um, I think you, know, you probably both benefit from it. And you have to keep in mind too, let's say you're the student who's, who's swamped, you can't study all the time. It's not good for you and you're not going to remember it. So I think it, it's important to really take some time off for yourself. Now, speaking of studying all the time, there's another group that has a vested interest in that, and that is parents. How do you handle the difficulty when you're, when you're faced with parents that are, you know, with your own best interests in mind, are right in your face about, have you studied, uh, show me your work, what have you done? How do you deal with that when, when there's a, should we say, a domineering parent sure. uh, over-involved, maybe? Yeah, I think that can be a very common concern. Something I see here a lot is that parents want their children to have a certain career, a certain major that their kid may not want, or that's maybe not a good fit, that maybe they're not even good at that. Um, and in an extreme case, if you have a parent who just won't relent, who maybe has some of their own personality issues, um, sometimes the best advice is to distance yourself from that parent a little bit, um, you know, if it's really going to cause a huge conflict. But if, let's assume that the parents are, are pretty reasonable and they just want you to be successful. Um, I think it can help to really find out what you're passionate about. Um, you know, and if you're not sure what that is, maybe getting some career testing to find out what's a good fit with your personality. Um, because if your parents are pushing you in a direction that's not a good fit, it's not very likely you're going to succeed in that. And then everybody's disappointed. Your parents are upset, you're upset. So I think um, it, it benefits both the student and the parent for you to find something you're really good at because then you're actually going to be successful at that. So I think if you can find, first find what you're passionate at, find what's a good fit for you, and then demonstrating to your parent how good you are at that. And look, you know, look, when I was doing pre-med, I was getting all C's. Now that I've switched to psychology, I'm getting all A's. And the parents are going to be happy about that, too. They feel like they're, you know, if they're helping you out financially, they're getting a return on, on their investment and that you're actually going to succeed at that. And also, um, you know, college is a time where lots of folks are, are kind of pulling away from the parents, but not in a bad way. You're just finding yourself as an individual as different from your family. And sometimes it can be helpful to just move out of your parents' house if it's financially feasible, um, that sometimes you've just worn out your welcome a little bit by staying you know, into your 20s. Um, now, sometimes financially, you, you just have to do that. But if there's any way to kind of move out of the parents' house, carve your own life and your own identity, sometimes that can improve a lot of those relationships just from having a little distance. Too. I can offer the parent side of that in that I have a son in college right now uh, and I know his track record through high school was that his very best grades were in English and history. He is in his own head determined to be a doctor. He's, he's pre-med right now uh, and I've been just stifling the opportunity to jump in and point out to him, you know, look at your grades and it suggests to me that something like being a lawyer would probably pull to your strengths, play to your strengths better. Uh, and I've simply held off. I've just, you know, he's got to find it for himself. Uh, and it was interesting that about a year ago, not even that, a year ago now, where before he was only talking about the MCAT, now all of a sudden he's talking about the LSAT and the GRE. 
The LSAT was introduced about six months ago in his conversation, and the GRE about two months ago. Uh, so he is gradually finding his own way. So if we can just encourage, you know, stiff arm your parents, uh, you'll find your way, sure. uh, basically, in, in that situation. I had one other area that I particularly wanted to talk to you about, and that is roommate conflict. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? Roommate conflict, I think, is inevitable, right? So you're living with someone, you're bound to have some disagreement. So I think it helps from that standpoint to just say, this is normal. Um, you can't live with anyone 24-7 and not get into some sort of disagreement. Now, where I see this becoming more problematic is when there's one roommate who is just really non-confrontational. Maybe there's all this other stuff that their roommate's doing that's really irritating to them, but they just don't know how to bring it up, and then they just start building all this resentment. Now, um, if you consider yourself a non-confrontational person, um, you're usually going to have trouble bringing up areas of disagreement. Now, what I usually find with that is people get this idea that in order to be confrontational or to, to um, you know, address an area of contention with someone, they have to be really mean, or they have to be really forceful, and they have to just go in and, and just lay down the law. And that's actually not the case. There's a thousand different ways that you can bring up an area of conflict with someone. And I found a good technique, it's called the sandwich technique. So you don't just go in there and just you know, lay it all out on what you hate about your roommate. Because uh, that's only going to make them become defensive and it's not likely to get you very far. Um, but one good way to do it is to start off with a compliment. Let's say your roommate does something really well, like they keep their area really clean. You can start off by complimenting that, telling them how much you appreciate that. But let's say maybe they, they watch TV to too late at night when you're trying to sleep. Start off with the compliment and say that, you know, it would just be great if, if you could turn off the TV a little earlier, use headphones or something like that. And then end with another compliment. So you've got this, this sort of constructive feedback sandwich in between two compliments. That's a lot easier to hear. And usually the roommate's going to come out feeling, feeling pretty good that you're noticing the things that they're doing well. I think another thing that helps out is to come at them with a compromise already in mind. So rather than just attacking them and telling them what they're doing wrong, um, have a solution in mind already. Or if you know that you do something that they don't like so much, offer to work on that. And I think that's, um, if you consider yourself a non-confrontational person, that feels a little more doable than thinking you just have to go in there and be really mean. Very good. Kate Shaw, a PsyD from our counseling center. Be interesting for you to go over and talk to her as you have the time. Thank you, Great. Kate. Thank you. We have enjoyed it.